Hello everybody, I am Jarrett Ross, a genie vlogger, and on today's vlog, I will be discussing what we can expect for the future of genealogy. The genealogy world has expanded at an exponential rate over the past few decades. Along with the advancements in the internet, digitization technologies, and the expansion of consumer DNA tests, every year brings new tools, new sets of records, and new breakthroughs in research, reshaping our understanding of history and family history. So what can we expect for the future of genealogy? While we don't know what big breakthroughs may lie ahead, there are indications of some things that we can expect. DNA has been without a doubt one of the biggest breakthroughs when it comes to genealogy research. So I spoke with my friend, cousin, and colleague Michael Waz about the history of DNA testing for genealogy and what we can expect in the future. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Michael Waz. I am co-founder of Hollander Waz Jewish Heritage Services. I have been working in uh, DNA and historic preservation and genealogy for much of my professional life. I volunteer with the Avotenu DNA Project, otherwise known as the Genetic Census of the Jewish People. So DNA testing has a fairly long history in modern uh, genealogy world with the advent of the internet and websites like Ancestry.com, they all sort of rise at the same time in the late 90s. During the 90s, uh, you had increased accessibility to DNA testing, primarily because the cost of it was coming down. And what we would consider today uh, to be simple and even backward in many cases was groundbreaking in accessibility back in the 90s. So the early pioneers in genetic genealogy of which family tree DNA is pretty much the only surviving one we're offering in terms of Y DNA, you know, Y12 or these, you know, these very basic haplotypes that were groundbreaking in the academic world in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but they cost so much money uh, for each test. Now, these tests are the cheapest possible thing you can do. They opened the door and then there was the National Geographic uh, Genographic Project, which was a collaboration between National Geographic, Family Tree DNA, and other academic institutions. Technology with mitochondrial DNA was a lot more accessible because it uh, became a lot cheaper, a lot quicker. Now today, it, you can get it for under $100 on sale. Later on, the first second of the 2000s, the advent of autosomal or family tree matching DNA that looked at the entire spectrum, which was in of itself groundbreaking for genealogy because before you only had the singular line that you could look at with Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA, but now you could look at the spectrum. At the same time, you start seeing um, uh, next generation sequencing or whole genomic sequencing, which was really expensive, uh, but that had been doing with uh, 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 for a few years since the, basically the early 2000s, like with the Human Genomes Project. I think it was 2012 or so, Family Tree DNA pioneers uh, the next generation sequencing offering to consumers writ large alongside a Full Genomes Corporation, which formed around the same time, roughly. It essentially drove the Y-DNA revolution into overdrive because all of a sudden, uh, science was gaining access to thousands and thousands of undiscovered uh, Y chromosomes, and the tree had gone from, you know, a few thousand branches here and there to, at this point, it's got to be almost a million or if not millions, but whole genome uh, sequencing, whole genomic sequencing is where um, the field is going. And that price is now matching, uh, in some cases, uh, the next generation sequencing from family tree DNA. But in addition to that, you're getting your autosomal and your mitochondrial DNA. So now we're dealing into medically relevant areas. And that's really where we're at. I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that uh, will respond to the uh, drop in price of whole genomic sequencing, or if we'll start to see you know, Ancestry get into that game, um, or 23andMe. We already know gene by gene that they have it, but they're using it for medical uh, clients at the moment. 
Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how this goes. With the first consumer grade DNA test becoming available at the turn of the millennium, and then autosomal DNA testing coming out in 2007 with 23andMe, since then the consumer DNA industry has grown exponentially with genealogical DNA databases now hosting over 40 million DNA profiles altogether. This growth also allows for more in-depth genetic genealogy research as more genetic cousins can be properly identified within the shared family tree. The main thing being that this allows more reconstructed genomes to be created. A reconstructed genome is when the genome of a deceased ancestor is reconstructed using known relatives and descendants. So even if grandpa has passed away, you could still create a DNA profile for him by comparing the DNA of his descendants and relatives who have also done DNA testing. And this all really comes down to the basics of what is commonly known as DNA painting, which is just assigning the inheritance of certain segments of your DNA to specific ancestors. The way it works is that if you share DNA with a known relative where you know how you're related, then that DNA must come from your shared ancestors. Let's say that you match a second cousin through grandpa's sister. That shared DNA can be assumed to come from your great grandparents, but more specifically, it was inherited from your grandpa. So just like a puzzle piece, we can place that shared DNA segment as our first piece. And as you match more cousins, you get more pieces to add to the puzzle. Once you have enough pieces, you can make a DNA profile for grandpa that can be used in a genealogy database, which could lead to some pretty amazing breakthroughs. And this is something that can be done right now through GEDmatch's Lazarus tool, which is part of their tier one tools. But the biggest problem that most people have at the current moment being able to do that is that they just don't have enough matches on GEDmatch with a known relationship path where they can confidently create enough of a genetic profile to be able to compare in the database. Yet we know that these databases are ever increasing. More and more people are taking DNA tests and uploading it to different platforms. And it's just a matter of time before more people are able to create reconstructed genomes for their deceased ancestors. And to add another layer to this, as the amount of reconstructed genomes increases, this will also allow us to then use the reconstructed genomes to create more reconstructed genomes for even further distantly related ancestors. Basically imagine it being a commonplace thing to be able to have a DNA profile for ancestors who lived in the 19th and 18th centuries, which could honestly help solve mysteries dating back to the 17th and 16th centuries. But will that be the only way to get a DNA profile for an ancestor? No, it can also be done through artifact testing and rootless hair testing. Artifact testing, which is also known as touch DNA, is when you extract DNA from something that someone touched or handled. And this is a technique which has been used in forensics for decades to solve crime, but is also available for consumers for personal genealogy purposes. To the letter is a company which has been doing this for years, mostly extracting DNA from stamps because whoever wrote the letter might have licked that stamp and being that the stamp was stuck to the envelope since then, this allows for preservation of DNA. Doing this does require the destruction of whatever item that is, and you're still running the risk that there is no viable DNA profile that can be extracted. So for anyone who's planning on doing this now, be understanding that whatever you send in isn't coming back. So if it's a really precious letter or something that you really don't want destroyed, then it might be better to wait until methods improve. And this is important because there are a lot of issues with artifact testing, especially in the consumer market. Some of these issues include low amounts of DNA, highly degraded DNA, issues of mixtures of DNA where there's more than one person, and of course the possibility that the DNA you're sending in isn't coming from the person you think it's coming from. And that's not even considering the ethics behind a lot of this, especially in the understanding that this opens up the ability of people to get DNA profiles of pretty much anybody. The forensic industry has spent years advancing technology to use less DNA 
with higher amounts of degradation, and is even able to statistically determine separate DNA profiles from mixtures of multiple people, known as probabilistic genotyping. Yet this technology advancement has mostly been focused on STR markers, also known as short tandem repeats, both autosomal and Y chromosome, which are different than the autosomal SNP markers or single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are used for genetic genealogy. And in talking with Michael Waz, he helped explain the difference between SNP markers and STR markers, especially in reference to genetic genealogy. A STR, which stands for short tandem repeat, is a location on the Y chromosome, or actually can be in any part of the DNA, but for the purposes of genetic genealogy is used exclusively in the region of Y-DNA, where a neighborhood on the Y chromosome um, has a series of repeats, uh, letters, there's in DNA, there's ATCG. At a given location in the Y chromosome, there could be 11 repeats of AATG, that four-letter uh, combination over and over again. A SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is used in autosomal, in mitochondrial, and Y-DNA, is actually the specific spot in that location where you have ATCG, it's not a neighborhood or a series of repeats, it's the specific point. And so you can have a letter A and then this SNP happens and now it's C. And now we are seeing that all descendants of this man have that mutation, whereas descendants of his brother do not have that mutation. As Michael mentioned, in genetic genealogy, STR markers are almost exclusively used for Y chromosome DNA testing. Whereas for forensics, they're using STR markers on both Y chromosome and autosomal DNA. And these forensic STR tests are using about 13 to 20 locations for comparisons to a single standard. A standard being a DNA sample from a known person. And while they can also use it for some familial matching, it's basically limited to a first degree relative so being able to match a parent, sibling, or child. For genealogy, they're usually using about 700,000 SNP locations, but it also allows for a much further range of familial matching. This means that a viable DNA profile for genealogy purposes will require more DNA at a less degraded state than a basic STR comparison. And this is why a lot of these companies will have you spit so much into these tubes because they want to ensure they have more than enough DNA to create a viable profile. And as technology advances, we'll likely need less DNA for testing, with degradation also making less of an impact on final results. But genealogy might also be possible with testing fewer SNPs. This is already being done in the forensic field through Virgin's new Forensic Intelligence Kit, which uses only 10,230 SNPs as opposed to the typical 700,000. This technology is so new that earlier this year, my team at DNA Labs International was the first accredited lab to identify unknown human remains using the new technology. And while these technological advancements are being mostly implemented in the forensic industry, I think it's just a matter of time before a lot of them start to find their way to consumers. And some of the other technological advancements being used in the forensic field that will find its way to the consumer are new methods of extraction. A major one for genealogy being rootless hair extraction, especially since so many people have inherited locks of hair from ancestors. Typically, obtaining DNA from hair requires the hair root something which most locks of hair don't have. But these new methods in extraction are allowing viable DNA profiles to actually be pulled out of these rootless hairs, which would open up a whole new world for people who can then test these locks of hair they have from ancestors and start to get viable profiles that they can then really expand their family tree. While DNA has certainly been a major part of advancements for genealogy, so has the ever-increasing digitization of documents throughout the world. It's no question how different things are from 20 years ago when barely anything was online and most genealogists had to personally visit archives and libraries to even make just a little progress. Now, many people can log into a family tree website 
and create a large family tree with dozens of documents on their family within just a few hours. Yet the interesting part is we've only seen the tip of the iceberg for this because more and more digitization projects are being started all across the world every day. Even personal family collections are being digitized at an ever-increasing rate, a lot of times for preservation, but many are also finding their ways to being publicly available. But something that really needs to be noted here is that a lot of these digitization projects which have finished or are in the process have not even started to be indexed. Basically, you're not going to be able to find these records through a search engine database like Ancestry. Instead, you're gonna to have to pull out that full record book, although digitized, and go page by page. Right now, most of the records you'll be able to easily find through these genealogy search engines are the basic types of records that are most often discussed with genealogy. Birth, marriage, death, census, military, immigration, and church records. Sometimes you might find some probate records, sometimes some land records, or maybe some other special record set. But many of these types of records currently require more advanced research skills to locate. It takes time to transcribe records and make them searchable. So with an ever-increasing backlog of items, there becomes a constant flow of newly searched record sets. But there is something that will help increase the number of searchable records, OCR technology, also known as optical character recognition. This technology teaches a computer how to read and transcribe documents. It's actually super common and multiple genealogy databases have used this technology. Most recently, when the 1950 census was released earlier this year, OCR technology was initially used to make the census searchable on multiple websites, although there were a lot of errors. The difficult for using OCR technology on historical documents like the census is that handwriting is inconsistent, especially from person to person, not even considering issues with faded text, ink blotches, stains, and other possible issues. So OCR still has a long way to go, but it's only going to get better and better with time. And I honestly imagine that we could reach a point where we'd be able to find a document with our ancestor's signature, screenshot that signature, then upload it to a database and get results back from other documents with that same signature. Imagine using that and then finding notes that your grandparents wrote to other people in their yearbooks. And especially all the various record sets that are really valuable but really hard to correlate to specific ancestors. Things like notorial records, school records, businesses, clubs, and honestly any place you can imagine that someone might leave even the most minute of a paper trail where they don't even put their name because all you would need is their handwriting. But another piece of technology that I think is going to be a major part of the future genealogical landscape, facial recognition. And honestly, facial recognition is something that a lot of people are already familiar with. It's extremely common on a lot of social media websites. And it's actually the same technology used for those face filters you see on all sorts of apps. We're trying to, we're tr can you hear me judge? I can hear you, I think it's a filter. Yet I imagine a lot of people haven't even really considered it for genealogical purposes. And I have to admit that I hadn't even thought about it until I saw a talk from Scott Genzer at the 2020 International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies Conference online. Yes, hi, I'm Scott Genzer. I'm a data scientist by day, genealogy, uh, genealogist, I should say, in the evening and um, pleasure to be here. Really, facial recognition with software right now is really pretty basic. And people think it's like something out of some sci-fi movie. But to be honest, most of it is pretty, we're still in a very basic state. So not just facial recognition, but all what we call artificial intelligence or this subset called machine learning. Um, basically, it's just a matter of finding patterns. So if you want to teach a computer to find out where your face is in a picture, what they have to do is they have to train the computer like a dog. And so what they do is they show humans, they would show a picture of you and they would say, okay, take your mouse and draw a rectangle around Jared's face. And then they would go and do that for as many people in a bunch of pictures. And eventually the computer starts to figure out there's a change in, in, you know, in some kind of pixels from a person's forehead uh, to their hairline. And there's these things that stick out that are ears. They don't know it's ears, but the computer starts to see there are these round things. 
and they, you know, there's sort of a bottom here. So then it starts to figure out because humans have drawn these rectangles over thousands of faces. And the computer starts to get better and better at it. And then once the computer finds the bounding box, then we ask the humans, okay, now click on the right eyeball of every picture. And so some poor college kid to make a few bucks had to go and click right eyeball, right eyeball. And of course, for us, it's so easy, but a computer starts to figure out, oh, okay, that's how computer learns. And that's how facial recognition works. And so it finds this bounding box and then it finds the eyes, it finds nose, mouth, and it finds other what they call landmarks. And then it just goes and measures the relative distances to get a shape, like an oval shape head versus a round head. It just measures distances. So I started using facial recognition with genealogy um, when I had a large collection of photographs from the town that my grandparents came from in Mielitz, Poland. They were hanging in this museum and uh, they didn't know who they were. And so, and sort of, I just had a brainstorm that if I could just match people that I knew from studying from this town uh, with the unidentified faces in this museum, then maybe we could, I, we could reconnect uh, the picture with the family. And I thought that would be a great thing. What I did was I just went on every possible source that I could find and you know, started taking you know, crop pictures of all of these uh, faces who had names attached. So I went to Ancestry and I started cropping all those naturalization documents, passport applications, and I did Yad Vashem and so on. And all of a sudden I realized that there were tons of places where there were pictures that people just ordinarily didn't use. And I just started making a catalog, just like a folder in my computer. Once I had that, then I started cropping the faces of the pictures in the pictures that I didn't know who they were. And then I just let the software just do its thing. And the first time I have to tell you what had happened, it was like my jaw just dropped. Like it was just mind blowing. And it said, it's this person. And it was just so amazing. I can't even describe it. So I really see it going um, the same direction as we've been going with vital records and indexing for years. I think this is a whole, to use the jargon, there's a whole nother vector. Um, that basically, if you can imagine where we were with DNA is probably a better example. And so you can imagine you have vital records and then you have uh, DNA, right? And, the, and they're amazingly, they complement one another very well. Just imagine now a third completely independent way of finding connections. That's where I see facial recognition going. I hope that we will get to a point where we use it as often as we use DNA now. Now for, for anyone watching that would want to try this out themselves, uh, what type of basic knowledge would they need to actually be able to do this? So this is the most common question I get is, can we just take a face of somebody we know and try to, and, and we have a face of somebody we don't know and have the computer say, are these the same person? That anyone can do, because the reason is, is that uh, that familysearch.org, which most genealogy researchers know about, actually have a free uh, version of it that you can use. All you have to do is go to familysearch.org. They'll let you go and compare. Just so you know, you have to read the terms of service. If you upload faces to Family Search, just so you know, you are agreeing to let them store the face and use it for whatever research they do. So there's some privacy concerns that you should read the terms of service about. But for anybody, it's just drag and drop, and it will simply give you a percentage match. If anyone wants to do a bigger project like what I did, um, you do need some technical expertise. I try to help people where I can, but you just have to have some experience. Unfortunately, to build anything more complex than that, you do need to know a little bit about coding and website development and API work and so on. Uh, the rest of it is not quite there yet. You uh, actually just touched on something that I wanted to talk about, and that was ethical concerns with this type of technology. Absolutely. It's probably one of my biggest concerns. And every time I do this talk, I, I try to emphasize it so much that sometimes people get a little scared. It is a major privacy concern. And so, the, you know, the normal ground rules for genealogy, where you, you know, generally, you know, you keep private information about living people, um, is even more important with facial recognition because, um, you know, yes, if you certainly don't want to share somebody's birthday, whatever, but faces are even more prone to being abused. You can imagine that if we had this technology, you know, you could sit on the side of the street and take a picture of somebody and boom, you know who that is. I think China has done this. Yeah. And, and I don't think we want to be there. People have to be really careful about it. And so actually that common question you just asked me before about how could people get started I could create a website in about an hour to have people compare faces one by one and, you know, many to one. The technology is easy, but I won't do it. 
um, because I, it's a Pandora's box because then what would prevent anybody from going and putting a picture of somebody that, of, from their phone on the street and saying, you know, oh, that's Jared. Well, that to me is a massive invasion of privacy. And that goes for websites that are online already. Um, I tell people all the time, read the terms of service, read about where that data is being stored at rest. Where do they keep, you know, when they say the cloud, there, there's another thing as a cloud. There's a, there's a big place with a lot of computers that is a cloud. And where is that place? What are the security protocols? And so I, I tell people proceed with caution. But there are a handful of websites and projects which are, are working towards genealogical goals with facial recognition. Civil War Photo Sleuth is a free website which focuses on identifying photographs from the Civil War era through facial recognition. Anyone can create a profile, upload a photograph, and then add any known information. And as the database grows, there'll be better chances of finding matches in unknown photos. And considering how expansive this could be, it could get to a point where you just take a photograph of an ancestor, upload it to a website, and then it identifies every single other photograph with that ancestor across the entire database. So you'd be able to upload all those photographs of relatives that you have no idea who they are, and if anyone else has uploaded a photograph of them, and even better, actually named them, then you'll have that name, and maybe you'll even be able to figure out some family secrets through this. And then flip it and imagine how many people might have photographs with your ancestors, and they don't know who your ancestors are, but you uploading your photographs could then match it. And all of a sudden you're finding photographs of your ancestors at all sorts of weddings, banquets, events, and maybe you can even find them in historical photos. So going back to that Civil War theme, imagine being able to look at big photographs of full regiments or different companies where you can get some pretty good images of enough faces that you can then create a map of them to then figure out their identity and maybe even bring more of a narrative to your ancestors civil war story. And then this could even be applied to all sorts of old film. Then include the expansive archives of photographs and films held by museums, archives, historical societies, and all sorts of other organizations. The possibilities almost seem endless. Now we certainly have a lot to look forward to when it comes to the future of genealogy. But one thing that I didn't really discuss a whole lot in this video was the consideration of a lot of ethical and moral guidelines to these advancements. And when I spoke to Michael, I thought he had something really good to say about that. Um, I think what's important to remember with DNA testing is uh, as we continue to get more and more information is to continue to remain cognizant of our obligations to be ethical with the information, but also to not look at it uh, without a critical eye. We far too often will see with DNA testing, unfortunately, um, and this is a product too of how it's being marketed, uh, that you know you do your test and you can find out how many percent you know of Irish or Jewish or Nigerian that you are. Now I'm especially excited about a lot of these DNA advancements, but comment down below and let me know. What are you most excited about? And for anyone who's interested in learning more about artifact testing, be sure to check out the interview I did with Blaine Bettinger at the Roots Tech Conference in 2020, where we talked about artifact testing and Blaine's experience actually trying it out. All you have to do is click right here. And if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. It really does help me out. You can also click right about here if you'd like to subscribe. It is completely free to do so. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Genie Vlogger. I'm the Genie Vlogger. I'll see you in my next video.